Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this session where we are going to discuss the AIMS questions that were asked in June 2020. I welcome all of you to today's session and this is probably going to be the last session in the series of AIMS recall and I hope you make the best of it. Now, what is the aim of this session? The aim of this session is to not actually dissect the question and the language of the question, but to understand what is the theme and the trend of the questions that were asked in the exam. Because once you get familiarity with the trend of the questions that are asked in AIMS exams, you will be ready for the future exams, the, the winter central institute exams, as well as the um, need PG 2021 because usually it uh, it sets a benchmark of the type of questions that can be asked. There were uh, standard questions that were asked in orthopedics but two particular questions were absolutely brand new never asked previously. We will discuss them and the concepts around them as well. Now the, all of these questions that we are going to discuss uh, today are recall based questions. So I'm sure you understand that uh, people have poor memory so the questions may not be accurately recalled but rest assured what we did was uh, I posted the question and the language of the question with the various options on my bone teacher orthopedics group as well as uh, Maro's Marolings group and students corrected the language as much as possible to their best memory and we have framed the questions in such a way. I will obviously try not to go into great details because uh, you are not here for that. You have learned orthopedics either from Maro or somewhere else and you are here to just learn about the new concepts that were asked in the AIMS exams. So I will just keep it short and crispy uh, without wasting any of your time. Uh, so let's just get on with it. So let's look at the first question, friends. Uh, what is the screening test for scoliosis in school children? Uh, is it a forward bending test? Is it a straight leg raising test? Or is it a backward bending test or standing on one leg test? Okay, so this is a pre pretty straightforward question and uh, we have discussed this in our videos as well. So let's quickly review what scoliosis is. Uh, scoliosis is basically lateral deviation. Lateral uh, deviation of spine, right? If you remember from our videos, scoliosis is basically a lateral deviation of spine. And this lateral deviation has to be more than 10 degrees. Okay, that's when you call it uh, scoliosis. Now, scoliosis also has another component that is the rotational component. Okay, so rotational component, the vertebrae is rotated. Now, because of the rotation of the vertebrae, because of the rotation of the vertebrae, uh, there will be a protuberance or abnormal protuberance of the ribs. So say this is your spine and there is a lateral deviation here. So this is the concave side and this is the convex side of the uh, scoliotic spine. On the convex side, you will notice that there is protuberance or protruding of the ribs. This is what is called as your rib hump. Okay, so this is what your scoliosis is. Now, you need to understand that, uh, that there are many types of scoliosis. So we have a classification for this. Uh, we call it uh, the structural and non-structural type of scoliosis. What do you mean by this? You see, non-structural scoliosis is scoliosis not because of structural abnormality. It means that there is something other than that. There is no structure that is abnormal. Structure is absolutely normal. Vertebrae is normal. Everything is normal. But the patient still has a skewed spine. Why is that? It is probably because of abnormal posturing. Abnormal posturing. People have a habit of standing or sitting in a unique or abnormal posture. It could be postural. It could be compensatory. It could be compensatory. Meaning that the spine is absolutely normal. But the limbs may be abnormal. Say the lower limbs. One limb is either short or long and because of this there will be an abnormal pelvic tilt and because of that to compensate for that the spine also has to bend to compensate for some other problem. So it is a compensatory scoliosis. So all of these are non-structural. Spine is absolutely normal. It could be because of inflammation or it could be because of pain also because of pain in the spine or uh, pain in the nerve endings or disc pain or discitis whatever all these things can cause a non-structural scoliosis. On the other hand, structural scoliosis means that there is a structural abnormality of the vertebrae. Now, structural scoliosis has various types, idiopathic being the most common type, and you have congenital and neuromuscular. So, idiopathic has three types, infantile, juvenile, and adolescent, depending on when they present to you. Right? The most common type of structural idiopathic 
scoliosis is adolescent type. All right, so this is a straightforward MCQ. Adolescent is the most common type of idiopathic structural scoliosis. Congenital scoliosis, they have abnormality in the vertebra since the birth. Since birth, so when you do an X-ray of a baby, you would find that the vertebra is abnormally developed. Maybe half of it is not developed. Maybe half of it is fused. Maybe both the vertebrae are fused. So some there is some some abnormality. Some abnormality. Congenital scoliosis was a previously asked AIMS question was a previously asked question, right? So if they do not synthesize completely, you call it a hemivertebrae, right? Bar vertebrae. So these are types of congenital abnormalities. You can find more of them in the videos that we have discussed. Now, what I want to discuss here is the screening test and the question. So how do you differentiate between structural and non-structural scoliosis clinically, right? For that, we have something known as Adams forward bending test okay so it's adams forward bending test where you ask the patient to bend forward now what happens when the patient bends forward when the patient bends forward if the patient had a compensatory or a non-structural scoliosis everything will straighten out okay so this is a patient who bends forward and because the structure is normal because the structure is normal, everything straightens out. Whereas if the patient had a structural scoliosis, means the vertebra had structural anomaly, even if the patient bends forward, at least the rotational component will still persist. And because of that, this rib hump will still be visible. This is the differentiating test for scoliosis right? Structural and non-structural scoliosis. This is used as a screening test. A lot of females, particularly adolescent females, are the ones who get this idiopathic adolescent scoliosis. So this test is performed in schools to pick up scoliosis early on, all right? So this is Adam's forward bending test, all right? Another thing I want you to remember about scoliosis that was asked previously is the Cobb's angle. Cobb's angle is used as the angle to measure the extent of scoliosis, the degree of scoliosis, how much scoliosis do you have, okay? So how do you measure it? You take the curve, the primary curve, and you take the topmost vertebra and the bottommost vertebra of the curve. And then you draw the line from the superior border of the topmost vertebra and the inferior border, inferior border of the bottommost vertebra. And you extend the line. And then you get an angle. That angle is known as Cobb's angle. And that was your previously asked question. Okay. So what is the answer to this question? Screening test for scoliosis in school going children is Adam's forward bending test. Is that clear? Now coming to the next question. Fish tail deformity is seen in which of the following fractures? Okay. So this was a new question. Never was it asked ever for your postgraduate entrance exam across the country. Although we ask this question to our postgraduates in their MS and DNB exam, this was never asked at your level. So I'm just going to give you the answer and I'm going to show you what it is. The answer here is distal end of humerus. Now let's see what this is. Okay. See fish tail deformity. How does the fish tail look like? This is how a fish's tail look like. Now this can occur in two conditions as far as you need to remember. The first condition is supracondylar humerus fracture. The second condition is lateral condyle humerus fracture. Right, so supracondylar humerus and lateral condyle humerus both of these occur at the distal end of the humerus. All right, so that is your memory. Now, let's see how. Now, let me show you supracondylar humerus fracture. This is the humerus. All right, now this is the distal end of the humerus. So, there is a fracture here just above the, the condyles. This is the supracondylar humerus fracture. Now, because of the tilt and the rotation of the distal fragment following the fracture, the proximal fragment appears to look like the tail of the fish. Appears to look like a tail of the fish and that is why it is called as a fish tail deformity occurring in supracondylar humerus fracture. Now, the other appearance is, say in lateral condylar, condylar humerus fracture, uh, if there is a fracture here, 
and if it goes into resorption as the child grows remember lateral condyle humerus fracture usually undergoes into non union right? and because of that if there is a resorption what happens there is this concave deformity that forms this concave deformity that forms and this concave deformity again looks like fish tail deformity all right again looks like fish tail deformity so it could be lateral condyle of the humerus fracture or supracondylar humerus fracture concave shaped resorption of the lateral condyle particularly of the capitulum so all of these things happening at the distal end of the humerus this gives you your fish tail deformity this was a brand new question now coming to the third question which is the most specific test for carpal tunnel syndrome very commonly asked question very commonly asked condition tinel's test fallon's test two point discrimination or durkan's test now let's see what carpal tunnel syndrome is what are the points you remember about carpal tunnel syndrome it is the entrapment neuropathy of which nerve the median nerve very good so which nerve median nerve where does it get entrapped in the carpal tunnel very good between the carpal bones as well as the transverse carpal ligament and flexor retinaculum transverse carpal ligament and flexor retinaculum okay it gets entrapped under that structure what is the most common cause direct mcq it is idiopathic we don't know it is idiopathic we don't know what are the other causes hypothyroidism rheumatoid arthritis diabetes pregnancy the whole list is there but the most common cause is idiopathic it occurs in which gender most commonly females more than males what is the usual age group middle age 30 to 60 what are the common symptoms because of entrapment of the median nerve the patient will have manifestations of compression of median nerve so paresthesia tingling numbness burning sensation in which distribution median nerve so what is the distribution of the median nerve finger number 1 2 3 and a half that's it now the usual symptoms or early symptoms are sensory symptoms early symptoms are sensory symptoms later symptoms are motor and when there is motor symptoms the prognosis is poor means the changes are becoming irreversible so these are the basic things that you already know about carpal tunnel syndrome right so this is the pathophysiology of carpal tunnel syndrome now what do you need to know you need to know the tests now usually carpal tunnel syndrome uh, is basically a clinical diagnosis and the patient tells you the classical symptoms they will tell you the patient has uh, you know night pains paresthesia tingling and numbness and pain in the night nocturnal pain is a very classical presentation okay and in the distribution of the median nerve so there will be sparing of the little finger little finger will usually not be involved because it's alnar distribution so that is it so when the patient comes to you you clinically examine and what are these tests that you can do perform for clinical examination remember all these tests you need to remember right so what were those tests you have uh, read in the videos or uh, watched in the videos or read in the books yes it is those fallon's test and reverse fallon's test what is fallon's and reverse fallon's test you are basically aggravating the symptomology by asking the patient to hold these positions for 30 to 60 seconds and when they do that the symptoms are reproduced so standards are fallon's and reverse fallon's test now is there anything more specific than these two tests yes we have direct median nerve compression test this is the most specific test this is known as durkan's test now what do you do in this test you directly compress on the median nerve and after compression after a few seconds the symptoms will be reproduced the patient will have pain or paresthesia this is your direct median nerve compression test other tests are also there like tourniquet test where you apply the the tourniquet around the carpal tunnel and inflate the cuff the pressure should be more than the systolic pressure of the patient and then the symptoms will slowly start to reproduce but the most specific test remains durkan's test now please remember the fact that carpal tunnel syndrome is a clinical diagnosis it's mostly clinical because the night symptoms and classical location of the pain and the age group all of these things match most of the times now if you are in doubt best to go with nerve conduction studies or electrodiagnostic testing they can be helpful to confirm or exclude carpal tunnel syndrome they also help you plan the treatment they give you prognosis and outcome of the 
the condition okay so remember overall overall if you ask me the best clinical test the best clinical test is durkan's test you can call it the most specific test but if they ask you what is the best investigation for carpal tunnel syndrome or overall what's the best investigation it is nerve conduction studies nerve conduction studies the overall best investigation for carpal tunnel syndrome is that clear so finally what is the answer which is the most specific test for carpal tunnel syndrome you should say Durkan's test and just after Durkan's test you will have Fallon's test so most is specific number one is Durkan's number two is Fallon's okay coming to the next question counter force brace is used in which of the following conditions again friends this is a brand new question never asked in postgraduate entrance exam at your level although postgraduates ms and dnbs have been asked this question multiple times and i'll tell you what it is so right off the bat i'll tell you the answer here is tennis elbow and we will start discussing this so that you understand the theme of the question now all of you remember what is tennis elbow right what is tennis elbow it is your lateral epicondylitis it is the inflammation of the muscles which originate or insert at the lateral epicondyle why because of repetitive trauma repetitive activities people who commonly repeatedly use their wrist extensors so who are these people people who play backhand tennis right people who rinse the clothes motorbike riders people who hammer all day long carpenters these are the people who overuse their wrist extensor now because of this repetitive overuse of wrist extensors what happens the common extensor origin of the wrist muscles will have inflammation now particularly which muscle is the culprit here it is extensor carpi radialis brevis more than extensor carpi radialis longus this is also an mcq so there will be pain at the lateral epicondyle particularly on extension of the wrist what is the cl clinical test to diagnose this condition you have your cousin's test you have your cousin's test what do you do in cousin's test friend you ask the patient to extend the wrist against resistance when the patient extends the wrist against resistance the pain and the symptom is reproduced at the lateral epicondyle another test is there known as modsler's test in modsler's test instead of asking the patient to extend the wrist you just ask the patient to extend the middle finger okay same symptomology will be reproduced so modsler's test or cousin's test why is there pain because there is inflammation now how can you treat this how can you treat this the first thing to do is ask the patient to change the activity that is causing the pain so modification of activity modification of activity whatever activity the patient is performing that aggravates the symptoms or causes the symptoms have to be changed have to be modified so that the patient does not have this pain now obviously it is easier said than done because the patient's livelihood may depend on that so the patient may not accept so you have to provide alternatives what are the alternatives that you can provide you can provide brace now this brace is the counter force brace now let me show you what this brace does see whenever the patient extends the wrist the wrist extensors because they originate from the lateral epicondyle will get stretched and this causes irritation and pain this causes irritation and pain now when you apply the counter force brace you apply it slightly distal to the problem area so you apply it distal to the lateral epicondyle now this counter force brace forms a constriction ring like force here now whenever the patient extends the wrist the muscles do contract but the force does not transmit beyond the brace so this area the problem area my friends will be spared it allows time for that area to heal right so whenever the wrist extends now after applying the force applying the brace the force of the muscles will not cross beyond the counter force brace thereby sparing the lateral epicondyle theek hai did you understand so here is the pain lateral epicondyle is the painful area now you apply the brace here now if you apply the brace here the muscle will contract only up to here because there is the counter force brace this area is spared 
without the brace whenever you contract the muscle the force will transmit to the lateral epicondyle now the brace is here the force is not transmitting to the lateral epicondyle hence it allows time to heal so look at this diagram so this is counter force brace for lateral epicondylitis tennis elbow similarly a counter force brace for medial epicondylitis medial epicondylitis is also known as golfer's elbow very good golfer's elbow what is the test for golfer's elbow reverse cousin's test reverse cousin's test so what did we understand in the treatment options modification of activity that causes pain brace counter force brace you can give NSAIDs, painkillers. You can give physiotherapy also. What is physiotherapy? You ask the patient to stretch the muscles. You ask the patient to stretch the muscles. For example, wrist extensors are causing the pain here. So how do you extend the wrist extensors? By flexing the wrist. By flexing the wrist. Now this chronic inflammation or constant irritation at the lateral epicondyle can also be treated by steroid injection. The master blaster anti-inflammatory drug just inject steroid, long-acting methylprednisolone, uh, you inject it and the pain will get suppressed. But there is a problem here. Steroids have a complication that can cause tendon rupture. So if you can avoid this, preferably avoid it. But no, if push comes to shove, you have to give steroids. The other treatment op option is debridement. You can do an open or arthroscopic debridement surgical all right, you go and release the muscles that are affected and you uh, remove the necrotic or inflamed tissue thereby augmenting the process of healing, thereby augmenting the process of healing. Now, recently, there's a lot of interest that is generated around something known as orthobiologics. Okay? You, you, this is nothing but using biological agents in the treatment of orthopedic problems. Biological agents biological agents in the treatment of orthopedic problems so what do you do here you basically take the patient's own system or patient's own healing system and introduce them locally at the problem area hoping to augment or accelerate the healing process so you can take the patient's own blood which is rich in a lot of healing factors growth factors that can heal the problem but there is a problem. Blood contains a lot of WBCs as well, which can cause inflammation and further aggravate the problem. What if we can remove the WBCs and just use the growth factors? Yes, we can. You take the blood, you centrifuge it and you remove the WBCs. And what are you left with? You're left with platelet-rich plasma. Now, this platelet-rich plasma is rich in your platelet-derived growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor fibroblast growth factors okay so these platelets are rich in platelet derived growth factor vascular endothelial growth factors and fibroblast growth factors and all these factors growth factors help in healing and it's very promising it is working and a lot of people are benefiting so especially in groups of people where you can't use steroids either because of abnormal glycemic control or risk of tendon rupture or patients who have uh, taken a few series of steroid injections are still not benefiting then those are the patients who ideal candidates for experimenting with platelet-rich plasma and it shows a lot of promise patients are benefiting another recent uh, introduction is stem cell therapy where you inject stem cells at the site of problem stem cells we all know grow very well and can grow into whatever you want it to grow and hopefully when you inject stem cells into that area it will grow into the uh, the tissue that is damaged or necrosed so there's a lot of research still going on these are kind of the new territory of orthopedics uh, if you want to keep this in your mind it will be probably helpful for your exam now coming to this question, I'm sure most of you guys got this right because it's a very straightforward question. A 30 year old patient, road traffic accidents, presents with abduction and external rotation. So there is abduction and external rotation of the right lower limb. What is the likely diagnosis? Can it be intertrochantric fracture or subtrochantric fracture? Because students said both of them were in the option. So I just kept both of them. Necofemur fracture anterior dislocation of hip or posterior dislocation of hip now this is a very straightforward question i'm sure all of you remember what is the attitude of posterior dislocation of hip it's flexion adduction and internal rotation with limb shortening anterior dislocation it's flexion abduction external rotation with limb lengthening and necofemur fracture intertrochantric fracture both of them present to you with external rotation 
right so the ideal answer here is c anterior dislocation of hip now let's review the various types of dislocations that you should know for your exam dashboard injury gives you a posterior dislocation of hip right and what will be the attitude of the limb it will be flexed at the hip adducted and internally rotated with limb shortening yes so fadir which is the most commonly injured nerve in posterior dislocation of hip yes sciatic nerve very good next anterior dislocation hip will be flexed abducted and externally rotated and there will be lengthening of the limb right which nerve gets injured in anterior dislocation of hip yes femoral nerve which is more common hip dislocation anterior or posterior yes posterior is the most common type right now look at this patient look at the attitude of this patient tell me what dislocation he or she has there is flexion at the hip yes and there is abduction yes and there is external rotation so flexion abduction external rotation so what is this yes this is anterior dislocation of hip what about this one there is flexion yes adduction but internal rotation so flexion adduction internal rotation what is this this is posterior dislocation of hip this is posterior dislocation of hip so please remember faber and fader and also remember whether the limb is lengthened or shortened now intertrochanteric versus neck of femur fracture do you recall which of these two fractures has more external rotation intertrochanteric has more external rotation neck of femur has less external rotation which of these two have more shortening intertrochanteric has more than 1 inch shortening and neck of femur has less than 1 inch shortening so please remember intertrochanteric or extra capsular fracture everything is extra shortening is extra and external rotation is also extra Finally, I want to review these X-rays with you. Just quickly identify the diagnosis based on these X-rays. Obviously, there is a dislocation of hip. Yes, is it anterior, posterior, or central? It looks like anterior. How can you say that? The GT tip is below the center of the acetabulum, suggesting what? There is lengthening. There is lengthening. All right. And what else? There is a rotation of the femur. What type of rotation? External rotation or internal rotation? External rotation. How can you say it's external rotation? the lesser trochanter is fully visible so there is external rotation and obviously the femur is abducted so there is abduction external rotation and lengthening so this is your anterior dislocation friends what about this one second x ray the head of the femur is inside the pelvis straight forward no brainer this is a central fracture dislocation all right central fracture dislocation now what about this head of the femur is outside the acetabulum so it's a dislocation the tip of the greater trochanter is proximally migrated means there is shortening what else the lesser trochanter is not visible means the limb is in internal rotation and the femur is adducted so adducted internally rotated and shortened what is it friends it is your posterior dislocation so finally what is the answer for this question abducted and externally rotated lower limb it is anteriorly dislocated hip anterior dislocation of hip now coming to this clinical question now a lot of confusion is there among students based on uh, the the words or the facts that were given in the question and the image that was shared so don't worry about it we'll explore everything around this question and the images and i will just teach you everything you need to answer these kind of questions okay so rest assured a 45 year old male uh, with backache for 20 years presents with complaints of neck stiffness uh, what is the likely diagnosis this is the patient's x ray here uh, to help you diagnose ankylosing spondylitis klippelfeld syndrome dish that is diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis remember forrester's disease and uh, sprengel deformity let's explore uh, so let's try to understand what these things are so based on the options let's start with ankylosing spondylitis you all know what ankylosing spondylitis is right it is uh, an inflammatory arthritis where there is enthesopathy or enthesitis which leads to enthesopathy and what is enthesis enthesis is the site of insertion of ligaments and tendons and that site undergoes inflammation and because of inflammation there is calcification at that particular area and because of that calcification bone starts to form and these bone uh, formations at these areas will become syndesmophytes if it happens in the spine and different parts of the body sacroiliitis is a very important characteristic cervical spine 
uh, very rarely gets involved. It gets involved, but extremely rarely in ankylosing spondylitis. So that is what you need to remember. Male patients, HLA, uh, B27 positive. What are the radiological findings here? General ones that you need to remember. You will have uh, what you call as your bamboo spine. All right. And you get your uh, dagger sign. Remember that dagger sign. Remember dagger sign and trolley track sign. All right, so these are your standard uh, spotter kind of questions, trolley track tra sign, tram track sign, dagger sign, bamboo spine, and all these things. We are not worried about that. We are going to focus on how to differentiate between these spines, the spines of ankylosing spondylitis, the spine of Dish or Forestier's disease, and the spine of Klippelfield syndrome. Now, please understand what happens in ankylosing spondylitis. There is inflammation at the enthesis, and because of that inflammation, there is enthesitis, Enthesitis leads to ossification and calcification and there will be bone formation and this bone formation is what is known as your syndesmophyte. So this is syndesmophytes. These syndesmophytes are thin in ankylosing spondylitis. Please understand that. Number one, they are thin and they are vertically oriented. These syndesmophytes are thin and vertically oriented and because there was a disc there before any of this pathology there will always be this disc space visible all right there will always be this disc space visible so look at this image disc space is visible although the vertebra is fused anteriorly and posteriorly but still there is disc space that is visible so that is very important finding and based on the image that is shown here you can see clearly that there is a disc space fusion anteriorly and posteriorly but still disc space so i am feeling it is ankylosing spondylitis but let's explore let's explore Klippelfield syndrome as well as uh, dish now look at this cervical spine what is this this is diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis Okay, this is diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, also known as Forestier's disease. This occurs in elderly population, so older age group. This occurs in older age group. Again, there will be flowing ossification. They have described this as flowing or florid ossification. Flowing or fluorid ossification, but where? Again, at the size of site of emphasis, but particularly just below the anterior longitudinal ligament. So it will be more anterior. There will be nothing posterior usually. It will be more anterior, right? And again, the disc space will usually be preserved. So elderly population, flowing or fluorid ossification under the anterior longitudinal ligament. All right now there are certain criteria mentioned some people say more than uh, four contiguous vertebral bodies need to be you know involved but understand that very simply you can see this flowing ossification fluorid ossification under the anterior longitudinal ligament anterior to the vertebral bodies and the disc space is maintained so again look at this cervical spine here you will notice that flowing and fluorid ossification involving one, two, three, four, five contiguous vertebrae just below the anterior longitudinal ligament on the anterior surface. This is your diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Another thing is, dish prefers thoracic spine. Usually it prefers thoracic. It can occur in cervical spine also friends, but usually it prefers thoracic spine. So that is the thing I wanted to keep in mind. So ankylosing spondylitis, you understood how it appears. A dish, you understood how it appears. Both of them have vertebral a disc visible still because it's still there it's not destroyed although there may be fusion anterior and posteriorly in ankylosing spondylitis in the form of bamboo spine and flowing or florid ossification just below ALL in your diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Now look at this spine what do you notice here you notice that the vertebral segments are not segmented so there is no gap between them they are an unsegmented so there are two or more unsegmented vertebral bodies this is what is known as Klippelfield syndrome. Okay, so this is unsegmented vertebrae. So there is no segmentation. So obviously, if there is no segmentation, means will you be able to see the disc? No disc. Why? Because congenitally there was no segmentation. So it's a segmentation defect. This is what your Klippelfield syndrome is. 
okay so remember what is the triad of klippel field syndrome tell me friends restriction of neck movement why is there restriction of neck movements why because there is no segmentation how will it move right now where is when there is no segmentation will the word the neck grow no to so short webbed neck short webbed neck okay short and webbed neck the neck will not grow because there is no segmentation and when the neck is short what happens the hairline relatively appears lower so low set hairline low set hairline theek hai samjhe so these are the this is the triad of klippel field syndrome okay klippel field syndrome and patients of klippel field syndrome may have scoliosis and may have sprengel shoulder what is sprengel shoulder congenital undescended scapula All right, so you can read about that in pediatric spine. So those are the things I want you to understand. So did you understand how to differentiate between the spines? Now look at this and tell me which is which. There is no segmentation here. They are all fused. What could this be? This is your Klippel field syndrome. Very good. There is visibility of disc here, disc here, disc here, but there is fusion anteriorly and posteriorly. bamboo like spine this is your ankylosing spondylitis there is visibility of disc here disc here disc here but there is ossification or florid flowing ossification underneath the anterior longitudinal ligament on the anterior surface what is this this is your dish theek hai right i'm not going to the great details i'm just teaching you how to pick up the right answer based on the scenario that you're given with now whatever must have been in the exam you can answer this question so based on the image and based on the findings suggested in the clinical vignette i am going with ankylosing spondylitis because it doesn't look like dish or klippel field syndrome theek hai if it were something else you are in a better position to answer this now in the exam now let's quickly review a few more spines that can be seen in the exam this is your picture frame vertebra picture frame vertebra friends where do you see picture frame vertebra quickly answer yes paget's disease very good very good next what is this this is your ivory vertebra ivory vertebra yes where do you see ivory vertebra yes again paget's disease where else where else you can say tuberculosis you can also say secondaries which type of secondaries blastic secondaries very good you can also say lymphomas can also say lymphomas and also osteoblastoma all these conditions can show you ivory vertebrae next what about this classical classical yes this is codfish vertebrae codfish vertebrae right what is the best answer for codfish vertebrae remember osteoporosis osteoporosis but that is not the only condition what are the other conditions osteomalacia osteomalacia hyper parathyroidism and hemoglobinopathies certain hemoglobinopathies all of these conditions can show you codfish vertebra and in my videos i have told you why it is called codfish vertebra and what about this one classical yes bullet shaped vertebra condition tell me one achondroplasia achondroplasia so these are the various types of spines that they can ask you as direct spotter type questions and one more bonus rugger jersey spine rugger jersey spine seen in renal osteodystrophy okay renal osteodystrophy theek hai Okay, coming to this straightforward question. In a case of meniscal tear, for repair, which of the following zones of meniscus shows best healing potential? So you need to understand what are the zones of meniscus and which zone of meniscus has the best healing potential to answer this question. So let's see. Okay, so this is the semilunar cartilage meniscus, right? So this is the outer surface and this is the inner surface. so it is divided into three zones red zone red white zone and white zone based on what based on the perfusion from the blood so how does the meniscus gets its blood supply so this is the 
This is the coronal section of the cross section of the knee joint. And let's zoom into the meniscus. This is the meniscus. Now, meniscus gets its nutrition from something known as perimeniscal capillary plexus. Let me show you this. Okay. So from the genuclear vessels, there are branches that come and supply the meniscus. This is known as perimeniscal capillary plexus. Okay. So this blood supply reaches from out to in. So the most vascular zone is the peripheral zone that is known as the red zone and the least vascular zone is the deeper white zone. Based on this, the meniscus has been divided into the red zone, red white zone and white zone. Okay, very simple. So peripheral gets direct blood supply, red zone, central does not get direct blood supply, white zone. So where does it get its nutrition from? It gets its nutrition from the synovial fluid. So if at all there is any injury in the meniscus, the one which is more vascular will heal better if you repair it. So if there is an injury in the meniscus and you attempt to repair it, you repair the one in the red zone, right? And that is repairing of the meniscus known as meniscography. meniscography okay so best results come from red zone so the answer is red zone so obviously if i ask you the worst results or the worst outcomes come in which zone white zone that is why not a lot of people repair white zone tears and that is why you remove the tear that is known as meniscectomy so white zone tear it will not heal so do not repair it remove it meniscectomy red zone tear it will heal so attempt to repair it meniscography now, one extra point I wanted to share with you is that at the time of birth, 50% of the meniscus is vascularized. But as you grow older, the vascular supply of the meniscus keeps on decreasing and it is only limited to the peripheral 10 to 25%. Right? So this is a possible new question that they can ask. Now, coming to the next question, direct spotter straight question, ring sequestrum is seen in, just memorize spin tract infection and I will tell you what this is. See, we apply external fixator for open fractures or compound fractures, right? So the pin that we insert into the bone, that is the shan spin, the shan spin makes a hole into the bone. Now, if it gets infected, if it gets infected, there will be death of the bone. That dead bone is sequestered. And that dead sequestrum will be in the shape of a ring around the pin. So ring sequestrum occurs at the pin tract sites of external fixator. So this is visible on x-ray. Dead bone is dense bone on x-ray. Okay, dead bone is dense bone on x-ray. And when you remove it surgically, this is sequesterectomy. Please memorize all the types of sequestrum and all of them have been asked as direct one-liner questions in your exam. So pause this video, take a screenshot, put it on your table and memorize it. Okay. Okay, coming to this straightforward clinical vignette uh, with an image based question, an old lady fell down and injured herself. She took traditional treatment, probably some quack treatment. After one year, she presented with a deformity and pain in hand. What is the likely diagnosis? All right, so you have a malunited extraarticular fracture of the wrist with dorsal displacement, malunited extraarticular fracture of wrist with volar displacement, malunited intraarticular fracture of wrist and extensor tenosynovitis. Look at the image. The image is a classical spotter, everyone. I mean, I, I don't think you will make a mistake ever if you have attended my classes or watched my videos. That is a classical dinner folk deformity. And dinner folk deformity occurs, occurs following which fracture? Yes, please. Coley's fracture. All of you know this. All of you should know this. What is Coley's fracture? It's an extra articular fracture of the distal end of the radius occurring at the cortico cancellus junction. So let me show you an x-ray of a, a Coley's fracture here. So friends, uh, this is your uh, radius and this is ulna, right? So there is a fracture here at the cortico cancellus junction. So this is a cortical bone. This is the cancellus bone, cortico cancellus junction, metaphyseo diaphyseal junction, all right? So it is an extra articular fracture. Articular surface is this, where it articulates with the carpal bones. So this fracture is extra articular outside the articular surface, okay? And what happens following the fracture? The two important displacements in the lateral view, you will notice that the distal fragment is going dorsally and in AP view, what will you notice that the distal fragment is going laterally, radial is lateral, right? So dorsally displaced, dorsally displaced. Again, if you want to re-emphasize what you have learned, look at this x-ray. There is a fracture here at the distal of the radius. 
extra articular articular surface is not involved at the cortico cancellous junction extra articular fracture and what is happening to the distal end of the radius it's getting dorsally displaced dorsally displaced okay what is this this is your colis fracture so it's an extra articular fracture okay what is the most common complication of colis fracture it's not malunion it's stiffness of fingers that is the most common complication second most common complication is malunion and which type of malunion friends Tinnerfoc deformity. So you can directly answer this question. It's a malunited mal extra articular fracture of the distal end of the wrist or distal end of the radius of the wrist with dorsal displacement. But let's see what the other options are. What is this fracture? Look at this. Again, this looks like a distal end of the radius fracture. Yes, very good. Extra articular. Yes, nevertheless. But what has happened to the distal fragment? It is went, it's gone ventrally. It's gone ventrally. What is this? This is the opposite of coles. Reverse coles, also known as smith's fracture which deformity does it give you garden spade deformity okay what about this there is a fracture and the fracture line goes intraarticularly fracture line is going intraarticularly this must be barton's fracture this is barton's fracture and what do you remember about barton's fracture it's not only a fracture it's a fracture with a carpal subluxation so fracture distal of the radius intra-articular goes inside the articular surface as well as carpal subluxation and finally what is this fracture it's a fracture of the radial styloid radial styloid this is your chauffeur's fracture chauffeur's fracture chauffeur's is a French word for driver, chauffeur's fracture. Okay, so straightforward answer, malunited extra articular fracture of the wrist with dorsal displacement. Remember those two Jipmer questions that were asked last year? What could be the fracture following a fall on an outstretched hand most commonly in an elderly female? Coley's fracture. Fall on an outstretched hand, elderly most common fracture? Coley's fracture. And then they changed a few words. They said, when the patient fell, her wrist was in extension. Okay, doesn't make a difference. If the wrist is in extension, she falls, the distal fragment goes dorsally. Again, it's Coley's fracture. What if the patient falls with the wrist in flexion? The distal fragment goes ventrally. The distal fragment goes ventrally. Which fracture would it be? Smith's fracture. Okay. All right, so the last question that we need to discuss here is indication for surgical intervention that is including biopsy in pot spine or TB spine are all except. So you need to know what are the indications of intervention or surgery in pot spine or TB spine. Let's look at the options. Is it drug resistance? Is it diagnosis unclear or doubtful diagnosis? Cold abscess without neurological deficit? Progressive cord equina syndrome? Evolving conus medullaris? Now, off the bat, if you have attended my classes, watched my videos, you remember two very important things. If there is a spinal cord involvement and if there is a bowel or bladder involvement, those are emergencies. It doesn't matter whether it's trauma, infection, TB, whatever, tumor, doesn't matter. If these two things happen, bowel bladder is involved, spinal cord is involved, it is an emergency. You have to intervene surgically. So right off the bat, you can clearly rule out this option because it's a clear cut indication for surgery, right? So you're left with drug resistance, doubtful diagnosis and cold abscess without neurological deficit. Okay, so let's uh, see the treatment and the indications of intervention in your uh, tuberculosis. So remember, TB spine is usually a clinical radiological diagnosis. It's a very easy diagnosis to make. Uh, we don't go for advanced investigations unless it's difficult to diagnose it. But if they ask you what is a gold standard investigation for TB spine, then remember the answer is CT guided biopsy. Okay, CT guided biopsy. Still an intervention. So let's understand what is the treatment uh, for TB spine. We follow the standard middle path regime suggested by Dr. S.M. Tully where the patient is asked to take bed rest with anti-tubercular treatment. There are clear surgical interventions. Usually the patients improve with these two things. And if they improve, we don't intervene surgically. But if they don't, means there is no improvement of conservative treatment. That is the time for surgical intervention. It can be in the form of biopsy to identify the condition if you're doubtful. So tissue sampling can be done if there is a diagnosis. It's a doubtful diagnosis. You don't know what could be. Increasing neurological deficit, obviously, if there is a neurological deficit that is not a decreasing after the treatment, but increasing means you have to go and intervene. Bowel and bladder involvement, I said across the board, whether it's trauma, tumor, TB, infection, doesn't matter. If they are involved, 
you intervene. Large abscess, not responding to treatment. Okay. Instability of the spine. Because spine is unstable, intervene and stabilize it. Cervical abscess, causing pressure symptoms like a dysphagia or dyspnea. And severe deformity, plus minus, this is controversial, severe deformity of the spine may or may not be an indication for surgical intervention. So clear indication here is that patient is not responding to conservative management, right? So patient here is drug resistant, it's not responding to conservative management. And if there's a doubtful diagnosis, yes, doubtful diagnosis is an indication for biopsy. If there is bowel bladder involvement or if there is worsening of neurological deficit, so yes, this Cold abscess without neurological deficit is not an indication for intervention. With that, I've covered all the questions that were asked in the AIMS exam uh, that were uh, directly orthopedic. I mean, there are a few questions that uh, overlap with pediatrics and medicine. Uh, so I've not uh, included it over here. You can read them or learn about them in those um, subjects. I just wanted to keep it short and crisp and tidy so that you get the best out of it from this time. If you want to learn more about these various permutations and combinations of questions, uh, there was a session that I did in December last year. Uh, a lot of you watched it and a lot of you benefited from it. It's called this brainstorming session. You can find it in this YouTube channel on Marrow. Uh, just look for it. I have discussed the previous uh, JIPMER and NEAT PG questions and various permutations and combinations. And I teach a lot of stuff there as well. So if you want to continue learning more about these questions, go ahead and watch this. Uh, if you're still confused regarding your preparation strategy, what you need to do in the last six months before the big day, go ahead and watch this video. I have, I've, I've spoken for an hour there. I've given various strategies for uh, different types of students, students who are finishing their preparation, st students who are midway through their preparation and students who are starting right about now. So that will be very helpful for you. Also, I want to talk about a few more important things. The first most important thing that I want to talk about is that all the teachers of Marrow, the Marrow team, the tech team, the support team, we all are with you in this difficult time of your preparation. This is not a typical difficult time for preparation because we are bogged down by a lot of things. I mean, there is a pandemic at hand. There are people dying all around and there is so much uncertainty and chaos in terms of what will happen in the future. And this is a bewildering time for each and every one of us. So I just want you, the ones who are watching this, to rest assured that you can count on us to be with you. And how can we be with you? We have just proved it to you. All of us, I mean, all the teachers on Marrow and the Marrow team and everyone in Marrow are working from home and we do not have the same technology and resources available uh, as it were available before. But nevertheless, all the teachers learned about it, including myself, and found ways to prepare this session for you. It was very difficult, constantly on phone with the tech team, learning how to set up the mic and the camera and the lights. All of us have done it and we have done it for you. People have recorded for two hours, three hours and four hours even. And they have done it with their busy schedules and, and the crisis all around. And they have done it for you so that you can learn the trends of the exam. And this is a proof that we are all with you. And if you need us, you can find us in various um, social media connections. You can find us on the Marrow Links group, right? So this is a group where all the Marrow students hang out. You can ask us questions here, your doubts here. You can learn about recent trends and advances that we occasionally share. If you have something that is bothering you, you can come and post it over here and we'll try to answer it. Keep it academic uh, because we really can't, you know, read everything that is there. So keep it academic. There are a lot of uh, hashtags there that you can go and review the uh, the queries of previous students that can help you. I want you to, you know, show some gratitude to all these teachers who have uh, prepared these sessions for you. So I want you to go ahead right now on the Marrow Links group, tag the teachers and tell them thank you because it was hard, man. Preparing this was hard. Uh, it's not easy. First, collecting the questions getting the correct answers for these uh, recall based questions and then preparing the audio visual for you in the limited amount of time we are doctors we are not technically savvy but we did it for you so if you need us these are the places you can find me i will try to answer your queries in the comments so be sure to leave them whether it is uh, orthopedic related preparation related we are here for you with that guys good night and have a great day